thank you everybody for your attendance today. It's, a, I think, a grand day where we will be launching the Collaborative Research Centre in Australian history. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce Bonnie Chu. Bonnie is the manager of the Aboriginal Education Centre at Federation University, and she'll be making the welcome to country. Thank you, Bonnie. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, my name is Bonnie and this is Wadarung Country. For my family, the Wadarung people, it's believed that our land was created by the ancient spirit Bunjil, the wedge-tailed eagle. Bunjil created the land and all of its features. He also created Kulin, man, from the clay of the riverbed and breathed life into him. Bunjil is believed to have came to rest at Lau Lau Falls and returned to the sky as the brightest star which looks over us today. My family has adapted to live in two worlds, walking continually on this land in Ballarat on which we stand for thousands of years. And Ballarat is a Wadarung word meaning resting place. A few other names you may be familiar with are Wadarung words around this area. Beat means muddy waters. Lau Lau, falling water. And my very favourite, Wendery, go away. <laughs> <laughs> we respect our provider with providing us with rich natural resources such as stone, ochre, water, flora and fauna. Continually in our culture we look to the sky for a guidance of a change of season. Ballarat is rich of remnant culturally significant sites including ceremonial grounds, scarred trees and artifactual artifact, <laughs> materials. These sites tell us of the continual tangible history of the area. An oral history passed down through my elders tells us of the known significant areas and these are able to tell us of the intangible history of this area. I would like to acknowledge my ancestors and pay respects to my elders both past and present and I would also like to pay my respects to elders that are in the room here today. Traditionally a welcome to country would have you take part in a smoking ceremony. This is to cleanse you of any negative energy that you may bring to our land. This ceremony holds great significance for my family as it asks our ancestors to return to the earth to protect us while we're here. On behalf of my elders, I would like to welcome you to our country and ask that you respect it as much as we do while you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Today is the culmination of more than three years work between Federation and University of Australia and its predecessor institutions and a wide range of community-based museums, galleries, institutes, local governments, associations, schools, libraries, repositories, industries and councils, all passionate about history and about its importance for understanding who we are and informing decisions about the future. I extend a special welcome to Professor Frank Stagnetti, who's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Innovation at Federation University, who I will soon call upon to formally launch the centre. I also acknowledge in our presence um, eminent historian Professor Weston Bate, OAM, and his wife Janice, a wonderful supporter of all things to do with history. So thank you very much for coming today and we appreciate your attendance. And a particularly warm welcome to Professor Tom Griffiths who will deliver our keynote address on the future of Australian history. And after morning tea, Dr Laura Kostansky will convene a World Cafe which is an attempt to bring together an unruly mob of people to conduct some collaborative planning to help shape the first year of the operation of the centre. The Collaborative Research Centre in Australian History, the acronym is pronounced CIRCA, brings together partner organisations with academic researchers and postgraduate students to discover and interpret <coughs> Australia's cultural heritage in a strategic long-term research program. The centre will have an international 
perspective, highlight the contemporary relevance of the research findings, and most importantly and distinctively, it will advance the strategic goals of the partners with whom we work, many of whom have representatives here today. The centre will enable researchers to gain access to a rich trove of archival material. Much of it is untouched and much of it is of national significance. And it will also make innovative use of technologies to interpret our cultural heritage for the public. So let me provide an illustration of how that already does work because the centre has been gearing up over the past couple of years. Against the trend, we have recruited 21 new high degree by research students in history over the past 18 months. And these students are all either accessing historical records or artefacts that are held by the partner organisations or doing research of strategic importance to those partner organisations. And in many cases, the students are jointly supervised by the honorary research fellows who are based in those partner organisations, many of whom themselves have completed uh, doctoral degrees and are undertaking research in history. So both our academic staff and the co-supervisors, honorary research fellows, at the partner organisations are contributing to the delivery of training workshops for our high degree by research students. And the findings are not just advancing scholarly knowledge in history, but are being taken up by the partner organisations to put on new displays, exhibitions, performances and interpretations for the public. So it is simply an arrangement that brings history to life. And I'm convinced it provides a platform for long-term strategic research programs in history. So I sincerely thank all of the academic and administrative staff at Federation University who have played a part in this exciting endeavour. And the many organisations who have brought tremendous goodwill, inspiration, energy, ideas, networks and expertise. I would especially like to thank the work of staff and volunteers from a wide range of organisations with whom we have already established strong partnerships. The Sovereign Hill Museums Association, including the Gold Museum and Nambul, the Museum of Australian Democracy at Eureka, the Public Records Office of Victoria, the State Library of Victoria, the History Teachers Association, the City of Ballarat, including the Library and the Art Gallery, the Ballarat Mechanics Institute, Ballarat Trades and Labor Council, the Australian War Memorial, the Royal Historical Society of Victoria, the National Trust of Victoria, the Ballarat and District Aboriginal Cooperative, and the many, many community-based historical associations and groups. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr Angela Murphy, who uh, undertook the original consultation with many of you here and drafted the proposal for the creation of the centre. Uh, without further ado, I would now like to call upon Professor Frank Stagnetti to make a few comments and in fact to formally launch the centre. Frank, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And it's, look, it's an absolute great pleasure to be here today and I'm just thrilled that I uh, have the opportunity to launch this uh, very fine uh, centre, which will be uh, iconic for the, uh, the new university. So I would also uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, and pay respects to their elders, both past and present, and, and those elders that may be here today. And thank you, Bonnie, for your um, warm uh, welcome. Uh, and also welcome to Australia's newest university, Federation University Australia is the, uh, the newest university in Australia operating just more than 100 days as a result of the merger of the former University of Ballarat and uh, Monash University Gippsland. And it's, uh, it's great to be 
uh, at the forefront of leading the, the research aspirations of a brand new university. Having said that though, its predecessors have a long history in Ballarat and also in the Latrobe Valley, uh, dating back to last century and dating back to the very roots of a lot of uh, uh, modern history of, of Ballarat uh, and, and democracy. Um, with the establishment of the School of Mines Ballarat uh, in 1870, I think it was. So we're both a, a unique institution being the brand newest university in Australia, but also being one of Australia's oldest uh, continuous uh, technical education providers and one of the third oldest uh, uh, providers of higher education in the country. So it's a really interesting uh, and a great privilege to be working in a university such as the one that we have. Equally, it's a great privilege to be working in a university that recognises the importance of Australian history and, uh, and it's something that I, I, I certainly applaud uh, the Dean and, and his colleagues for establishing. Uh, John, you've taken a few of the points that I was going to mention, so I won't go over them. But I would like to mention also that uh, CIRCA, uh, the Collaborative uh, Research Centre in Australian History, is a cross-campus and a cross-faculty uh, research institute, which also gives me great uh, pleasure. CIRCA is also built in strong strategic partnerships, and John's already mentioned some of those. Uh, but I'd also like to mention uh, the partners that have led to the establishment of this is the State uh, Library of Victoria, the Public Records Office, the Sovereign Hills Museum, uh, including Sovereign Hill Outdoor Museum, the Gold Museum in, in Nambul, the City of Ballarat, the Australian War Memorial, Historical Society of Victoria, Australian History Teachers Association, uh, the Museum of Australian Democracy at Eureka, and the Ballarat Mechanics Institute, the Art Gallery of Ballarat, the Ballarat Trades and Labour Council, and uh, Australian Catholic University. Today we launch uh, CIRCA, um, the newest uh, research centre of the newest university in Australia, so I think uh, you should take great pride in that, uh, with a full complement of three research professors uh, who will be associated with the research centre, 19 research active staff, 39 high degree by research students, including 21 new HDR students that uh, Professor MacDonald mentioned. Um, and five honours students and 18 adjunct and honorary staff. And I think that's an absolute great way to launch and start this centre. And it's just the beginning. So uh, congratulations to all of those. As John mentioned, the centre will enable researchers and HDR students to gain unparalleled, unparalleled access to a rich trove of archival material, much of it which is untouched and much of it sits with our strategic partners uh, to generate uh, research findings that will advance the strategic needs of both the university and the communities that the university serves. The centre will also develop a world-leading education and training program, including a history bridging program and a PhD program supported by industry scholarships, which trains researchers in historical methods, theory, new technologies and in writing. So I'd like to congratulate Professor, Professor John MacDonald, uh, his staff, academic staff here today, collaborators and the strategic partners for building a fine research centre that will significantly enhance the new university, but more importantly, encourage world-class research in Australian history. So well done. Thank you very much. Oh. And can I say I formally launched the centre? <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you uh, Frank, for your advice and support in the um, formation and ultimately securing institutional approval for the creation of the centre. And also like to acknowledge the collaborative research network that has provided funding for the um, event here today. So thank you very much for that. Our, our, uh, On to the keynote speech. Our keynote speaker is Professor Tom Griffiths, the WK Hancock Professor of History at the Australian National University. He's a scholar of international repute and I would say a true, one of our true public intellectuals. Um, we deeply appreciate you coming here to Ballarat today, Tom, to deliver a landmark speech on the future of Australian history. Um, Tom is a very humble man and requested that I keep his introduction brief. Um, however, I'll make two short comments. First, you, you do have a very deep connection to this area in that I understand your great-great-grandparents 
came to this region in the 1850s in search of gold. And secondly, uh, Tom is an exceptionally gifted communicator. There are some pieces of writing that you feel drawn back to time and time again. And for me, Tom, of all the things I've read as an academic over the past decade or so, if I was to narrow it down to a few sentences, it's, they're actually contained in the second last paragraph of your short essay titled, We Have Still Not Lived Long Enough, which is published on the 16th of February 2009 that analysed the striking recurrent realities of the Black Friday and Black Saturday bushfires. And in that paragraph, Tom writes in reference to Judge Stretton's declaration that people had not yet lived long enough to learn the lessons. He says, we were say he was saying that lived experience alone however vivid and traumatic, was never going to be enough to guide people in such circumstances. They also needed history. They needed, and we needed too, the distilled wisdom of the past, inherited and learned experience, and not just of the recent human past, but of the ancient human past and also of the deep biological past of the communities of trees. For in those histories lie the intractable patterns of our future. It's a beautiful piece of writing and a very powerful message about the importance of history. So will you join me in warmly welcoming our keynote speaker for today, Professor Tom Griffiths. Bonnie Clue uh, and elders of the Wadarung people, past and present, um, Professor um, Frank Stagnetti, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, John MacDonald, Executive Dean of the Faculty, members of the new CRC in Australian history, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the great honour of uh, inviting me to be with you today. I find the Eureka flag, especially now it has returned to the site of the stockade, one of the most moving artefacts in Australian history. Hand stitched and homemade, it is beautiful and fragile. It's also confidently vast, isn't it? Vast, its size declaring its political ambition. And it was called, as we know, simply called the Australian flag. And that southern cross of nighttime stars is indeed a powerful symbol of a new society dreaming under the canopy of a different sky. Spirit tree is what the Aranda people of central Australia called this constellation wheeling over outback skies. But for the nomadic Christians who arrived in the late 18th century, it appeared as another kind of spirit tree, one that they called a cross. It quickly became celebrated, as we know, as the glory of the Austral Hemisphere. And we have to remind ourselves that earlier generations of Australians knew the night sky much better than we do. Now, you know the story of the flag very well. And there are members of this audience who have done superb work to refine and deepen our appreciation of this sacred artefact. And I think especially, and with gratitude, of Anne Begg's Sunter's dedicated scholarship. But let us briefly recall the fate of the flag, stitched probably by the women of the gold fields, flying briefly on Bakery Hill and above the stockade, salvaged by a trooper. Its authenticity later questioned and then confirmed, displayed at the wonderful art gallery near the site of the soldiers' camp, souvenired over the years by admirers like pieces of the True Cross. And just last year, 
taken back across town again from the camp to the stockade and reverently exhibited where it once flew in defiance. And it's now the centrepiece, of course, of a museum about people power and the nature of Australian democracy. It has its place on the banner of Federation University. It is a fine symbol, I think, of a southern continent that has become a nation, of a quest for a new identity in a strange land, and of a people whose destiny is shaped by their inheritance of a distinct ecology, geography, and history. How have people who came to live under the Southern Cross viewed their history here? And how do we see it now and in the future? Well, one way that people have told the history of, Austra history, of history in Australia in the early uh, to mid 20th century was to locate it primarily overseas as part of an empire story. Australia was seen as a new transplanted society with a short and derivative history, a planned, peaceful and mostly successful offshoot of Imperial Britain. In this story, history and culture of stature came from abroad. Professional history then had its beginnings in the 19th century in Northern Hemisphere archives and universities, and it was a practice that was closely aligned with the rise of the nation state. Therefore, proper history began to develop in Australia only in late colonial society, and especially in tandem with the consolidation of the Commonwealth of Australia. The sources of history emphasised in this account came from learned society and from abroad. And they eventually took root in local institutions, especially universities, where they developed a professional interest in the science of the document and the making of nations. Aborigines, as non-literate, non-urban and non-national, could have no history and did not constitute a civilization. Thus, they could find no place in this national polity or national story. Australian history was seen to reach its academic apotheosis as the subject of the last lecture of a British history course in a university, and to flower fully only in the mid 20th century. This was a story that enabled Manning Clark in 1946 to see himself as embarking on a journey without maps. And Professor John Lanoz in 1959 to depict the history of Aboriginal people as a melancholy anthropological footnote. An alternative way to give an account of Australian historical consciousness and practice is one that has blossomed in our own lifetimes. It begins with the people who lived here for 2,000 generations before Europeans arrived and who developed their own forms of history making and whose civilization represents an extraordinary achievement in the history of humanity. One is then drawn to seek the roots of settler history in the colonial experience itself, in the newcomers' intimations of local human antiquity and in their encounters with those indigenous peoples and with the strange and wondrous land they inhabited and the canopy of southern stars they apprehended at night. The everyday moral and historical puzzles of modern Australian settlement, according to this interpretation, were inextricable from a contemplation of Aboriginal culture. Early local historians were pioneer storytellers and because of their attention to, to found objects, to particular places, to remembered individuals, they were more alert to the Aboriginal past than were most academic historians. What kind of history, they wondered, could a settler make in this profoundly Aboriginal place? In the final decades of the 20th century, when academic history sought to reconnect with these popular forms of history making, a dynamic chemistry was unleashed. The late academic rediscovery of the Aboriginal past, therefore, I think, has as much to do with a new scholarly regard for the local and the oral as it did with political and cultural enlightenment. As the practice of history changed, so did the past emerge in a new light. Mm. 
in this second revolutionary account of the history of history on this continent, we recognise history as not only a professional disciplinary practice, but also as an everyday and instinctive expression of our humanity. History, we know, is a systematic and reflective intellectual discipline with academic traditions and scholarly conventions, but it is also an unending dialogue between the present and the past and thus essential to human consciousness. It's conducted as part of the daily business of living, of knowing oneself and one's place, of grappling with memory and of finding meaning. Therefore, there is a vast spectrum of historical consciousness that includes forms of knowledge both instinctive and learned. The more richly that we can integrate these various influences, the better and more thoughtful our scholarship will be. History is therefore, in my view, best generated with a keen sense of place and community. Here in Ballarat, a regional city with, traditional, with a tradition of national consciousness, in a society forged by democratic ardour, in a landscape visibly shaped, shaped by the economy and ecology of the earth, in a community where popular and scholarly histories energetically intertwine, in a university that is itself a federation of regional identities. Here, and in Gippsland and in the Wimmera, you are well poised to make a truly creative and innovative contribution to the future of Australian history. Living and working here gives you privileged opportunities to complicate and enrich the continental national story with social, environmental and regional diversity and to dissolve the barriers between uh, the academy and the broader community and between scholars and practitioners. Here, you can advocate history as the highest of arts and the most demanding of scholarly pursuits and also as an everyday search for meaning for which there is an insatiable public and personal hunger. When we disentangle the history of history from professional and disciplinary preoccupations, we're free to recognise how closely history haunts experience. It didn't need to be imported. It was organic. It was there at the beginning. As impromptu storytelling, as desperate justification, as an expression of hope, as a search for meaning, it arises spontaneously out of experience, memory and aspiration. The Eureka flag was stitched, surely, with a tremulous sense of history. One of the most compelling commemorations of the rebellion was that of Raffaello Carboni, who returned to the site of the stockade a year afterwards and from the rising to the setting of the sun, gave a reading of his history published only two days before. The violence and tragedy of the stockade was instantly the subject of history. Remembered, retold and argued over from dawn on Sunday the 3rd of December. Its historical symbolism, its place in an evolving story of Western political tradition was immediately a vital and practical matter of personal and public fortunes. The legend began to be made in that bitter early morning light 160 years ago and has continued evolving ever since. The present to which we pay so much lip service, the present is only ever an ephemeral conciliation of the past and the future. The present is always caught in the act. It's always in the process of becoming, sometimes consciously and precipitately so. Often, I think, we historians are asked why we are interested in the past, the past that is gone. My answer is that the past is all we have. The present is but a breath. And the future doesn't exist except as a projection of the past. The past is all we have. The full sum of human experience is all we have on which to base our hopes and plans and from which to draw our conversations, ideas and stories. The empirical, reflective, 
holistic, scholarly study of that body of knowledge, of change over time, of how the past is in the present and the future, is vital to our humanity. The great historian and anthropologist Greg Denning once wrote that human beings are history makers. Of all the systems that are expressions of who a people are, the sharpest and clearest is their historical consciousness. Ballarat was the site of one of Australia's earliest historical societies, formed in 1896. At their first meeting, several members boasted of the relics they had hoarded. Mr John Noble Wilson declared that he had an Aboriginal skull among his possessions. It was not unusual at that time for a renowned collector to make such a boast. But what was the reaction of the gathering when Dr Joseph Francis Usher of the Ballarat District Hospital stood up and claimed to have in his collection the skull of an old pioneer? Did he mean what he was saying? Which pioneer, I wonder, and which Aboriginal? History must deal with the skeletons in the cupboard. When I was beginning my work as a historian in the 1980s, I was lucky to be employed by the State Library of Victoria as field officer, which involved the acquisition of historic manuscripts and pictures for the library's Australiana research collections. It was known as the cup of tea job for it took me into the lounge rooms of Victoria to discuss the, the future of family papers and the likely public uses of personal pasts. I was very fortunate to have the assistance of many historians in regional Australia in that work and I particularly pay tribute to those who were then working with the Centre for Gippsland Studies which is happily now part of Federation University. Some, some of you are here I think and I, I uh, remember fondly working with you and with other people in regional Victoria as we tried to gather the material legacy of our past. On one occasion I remember it, it was a cold October day and it started to snow as I entered Ballarat. On this day I had cause to visit the Ballarat City Council. When I was talking with one of the council officers he went to get some papers from a cupboard by his desk and when he opened the cupboard door I was shocked to see Bob Hawke inside. <laughs> well, it was Bob Hawke's head, actually. Indeed, it was a, a bust of the Prime Minister. Quite a feisty portrait, recently completed by Peter Nicholson, and about to be installed, of course, in the Prime Minister's Avenue in the Ballarat Botanical Gardens. You know, another example of Ballarat's national consciousness. I shouldn't have been surprised I now know that one often opens a cupboard of Ballarat history to find, if not a skeleton, then a national figure or a national story inside. Ballarat has always had a very keen and active historical consciousness, and so it is the perfect place to launch a collaborative research centre in Australian history. Perhaps this rich dimension of your cultural life comes from being the birthplace of a national legend. As Weston Bate wrote of Eureka in his wonderful and enduring book, Lucky City, the release of pent-up radical energies gave a whole generation at Ballarat a sense of national purpose. People here had no doubt that their golden city was national and imperial as well as local. And so Ballarat quickly became the first city in Australia to possess a genuine history when W.B. Withers' remarkable history of Ballarat was precociously published in 1870. And as the Federation of the Commonwealth was brewing in those final years of the 19th century, Ballarat proved itself an ardent federal city and touted itself even as a possible federal capital. Ballarat residents, after all, had invented the Australian flag and they remained keen to lay claim to the title of Australians. There is such a strong history of civic aspiration here. When that early historical society formed here in 1896, it called itself, of course, the Australian Historical 
Records Society. As well as collecting documents and memories of the gold days, its members worked with the Australian Natives Association in memorialising a local Aboriginal man known as King Billy or Frank who died in 1896. As Janice Newton has investigated, the society identified and mourned Frank, as was typical of the period, as the last of his race and built a memorial in the Ballarat Cemetery. The gold immigrants, as well as celebrating their own achievements, were slowly beginning to realise that becoming Australian meant coming to some accommodation with Indigenous peoples. In recent decades, the same monument became a site for affirming Aboriginal survival. That, that revolution in sensibility and understanding is one that I will elaborate in a moment. I want now to think through some of the historiographical revolutions that we've experienced in Australia over the last half century, all of which are still unfolding around us now and affect the way we see and write Australian history now and in the future. We'll be talking about them together later this morning and so I really just want to start the conversation. Let me be prompted by that Ballarat monument to King Billy to reflect that the greatest change in Australian history in my lifetime <coughs> concerns Aboriginal history. When I was born in the late 1950s, some scholarly Australians were still arguing that Aboriginal people had been in this continent for just a few thousand years, and some asserted an even briefer presence. There was also an assumption that Aboriginal culture had been unchanging and its environmental impact minimal. Australia has a settler history of resistance to the intimations of Aboriginal antiquity and adaptability. There was a reluctance among colonists to acknowledge the depth of belonging of a people whose continent they had usurped. Therefore, broad understanding of the human antiquity of Australia, always deeply known to Aboriginal people themselves, has been a relatively recent and dramatic event one that had to await the twin revolutions of professional archaeology and radiocarbon dating, both of which emerged in local practice in the 1950s and 1960s. No segment of the history of Homo sapiens, wrote archaeologist John Mulvaney, had been so escalated since Darwin took time off the mosaic standard. And since the 1960s, archaeological dates for human occupation in Australia have deepened from 13,000 years before the present at Kenneth Cave in <coughs> Queensland in 1962, one of Mulvaney's digs, to over 40,000 years at several sites by the 1980s, and to a likely 50 to 55,000 years in Arnhem Land. And this dating revolution linked Australia's human story to the Pleistocene era and to the environmental challenge of the last ice age. Thus, the continent could no longer be seen as the last of lands, one of the ways in which it was often referred to, no longer could see it that way as the last of lands to be colonised by humans. Instead, the voyage to Sahul, uh, as the greater continent of Ice Age Australia and New Guinea is called, was humanity's first deep ocean crossing. But it was to be Australia's land, the complex ecological reality of its creatures, soils and climate that would distinguish it as much as any sea barrier. Over tens of thousands of years, Australians developed a distinctive regional style of hunter-gatherer society. In 1969, when archaeologist Rhys Jones coined the term fire stick farming, to describe Aboriginal land management, he was deliberately provocative in applying that term farming to a people allegedly without agriculture. Different environmental pressures on the Australian continent led to a very different and to, Euro to Europeans an unrecognisable type of farming. Aboriginal culture, it emerged, was innovative as well as ancient. Australia was the site of the world's oldest cremation, perhaps of some of the earliest human art, the first watercraft to cross open ocean, the first evidence of edge ground axes, 
an early domesticated species in the dingo, millstones that predate agricultural revolutions elsewhere, and some of the most ancient physical remains of modern humans. As archaeologists began to sketch a deep history of humans under the Southern Cross, historians began to look again at the character of the modern Australian frontier and to write cross-cultural history of their own country. In the 1970s, a new journal called Aboriginal History was founded, and writers such as Henry Reynolds, Judith Wright, Diane Barwick and Ian Clark began to investigate Aboriginal historical perspectives and experiences. In books such as Reynolds' The Other Side of the Frontier and Judith Wright's The Cry for the Dead, both published in 1981, Australians were given the image of Aboriginal people sitting in their own country and discussing the European problem. Of course, it's worth remembering that the writer Eleanor Dark had made this imaginative leap into the indigenous world view 40 years earlier in her great novel, The Timeless Land, published in 1941, a book which I would suggest was possibly the most influential work in Australian history in the 20th century. Yes, it was a novel, but it was faithful to the historical sources and meticulously researched and referenced as Eleanor Dark's notebooks show. So much so that an early version of her preface began, this book has borrowed so much from history that it seems advisable to remind readers that it is fiction. History and fiction are a, an intriguing tag team, aren't they? Often working together in tandem and taking turns to lead us into new territory. The 1970s also saw the rise of, of social history and of what was called history from below. The British historian E.P. Thompson and his book The Making of the English Working Class was an inspiration, as was the British socialist journal History Workshop. Ethnographic history, championed in Australia by Greg Denning, Inga Clendinen, Rhys Isaac and Donna Merrick, ethnographic history also emerged as an influential model with its combination of anthropology and history, its attention to lived experience, its focus on encounters and episodes, and its elegant integration of narrative and structure. We can see, I think, the Australian bicentennial slice histories of the 1980s, especially the 1838 and, 1930, and, and 1888 volumes, and the subsequent work of Alan Atkinson, I think we can see these as substantial examples of the influence of the ethnographic method on Australian history. In the same period, the 1970s and 80s, feminist politics brought the experience and perspectives of women in both public and private life into the centre of writing and research of Australian history. Feminism did more than sensitise historians to the agency and distinctive experience of women. It did more than add subject matter to the substance of history. In the words of the American historian Joan Scott, it also forced a critical re-examination of the premises and standards of existing historical work. And it did this by developing gender as a category of historical analysis and by challenging us to pay attention to women and men as gendered beings. Masculinity as well as femininity came under closer historical study. And this change of focus brought analysis also of the history of sexuality and of sexual politics, of family life, children and domesticity, and a more seamless interrogation of public and private culture. The exciting biographical turn in historical scholarship, exemplified by Rani Keren's writing, responds to this renewed interest in subjectivity. Three examples of the way this range of work is changing our histories of the goldfields are from the 1980s, Pat Grimshaw, Chris McConville, Ellen McEwen and Charles Fay on family, community and demography in colonial Australia. From the 1990s, David Goodman's ethnographic and intellectual history of the gold rushes to Victoria and California entitled Gold Seeking. And from just this last year, Claire Wright's Stella Prize winning 
feisty and stylish history of women, men and families on the goldfields, the forgotten rebels of Eureka. While the history, the writing of history, while the writing of history was changing, Australia was also changing fast. This is what is so captivating about our craft of history. Because it's a dialogue between the ever-evolving present and the elusive past, it's constantly creative and surprising. Post-war immigration swiftly transformed British Australia. The 23 million people who live here now are very different to the 7 million Australians of 1945 and the 1 million of 1788. What kind of history of this country are our newest immigrants looking for? They probably seek histories that try to understand Australia's place in its region and its responsibilities as part of a global community. Histories that tell of earlier immigrants and the land and peoples they found here. And histories that reveal the capacity of Australian society for either inflexibility or resilience. What potential for prejudice and tolerance does our history afford? How have Australians managed religious and ethnic diversity in the past? What is the history of our attitudes to refugees? This is a vital and growing field of Australian history. To quote Klaus Neumann, one of our historians of refugees and asylum seekers, history is not only about understanding the present, it can also prompt us not to take the present for granted. History can respect the integrity of the past at the same time as aspire to change the world. Because stories determine the way we think and behave. An inquiry into multicultural Australia, past and present, is fittingly generated from a city born in a 19th century gold rush. The international demographic event that historian Eric Richards called this anarchy of immigration. The diggings were a famous melting pot. At least 17 nationalities were represented behind the stockade. People from southern China were the largest non-English speaking minority group on the Mount Alexander diggings, constituting about one quarter of the adult male population. And thanks to work by Keir Reeves and others, we're discovering now how different Australian goldfields history looked from a Chinese perspective. But we've also come to understand that the term British disguises much diversity. My own forebears lived in a Welsh mining community at Malden, and my great-grandfather, who was born in Australia and played among gum, gum trees and mullock heaps in the 1860s, did not learn to speak English until he went to school. That extraordinary, instant, international community of the goldfields reliant on a mining economy, looks more familiar to us today than it did to Australians a century ago. With the rise of ecological consciousness since the 1960s, environmental history has also changed the Australian story. Those well-worn metaphors that arose from the settlers' encounter with a strange land, of a land of uh, contrarieties, of droughts and flooding rains, and of upside-down nature. They have, with an ecological perspective, been given new life and dignity. Now, instead of being a mere artefact of settler sensibility, the wide brown land is also explicable as an ancient craton, a low-energy ecosystem, a boom-and-bust ecology, and an El Nino continent. The biological cringe about our monotonous gums, songless birds and fossil animals has been replaced by a deep historical narrative about the continent's Gondwanan inheritance, its long isolated voyage, voyage north into drier latitudes and its embrace by fire. The cultural disdain with which colonists noticed that native flora and fauna generally gave, a, gave way to imported exotics has become, I think, cultural pride in the evolutionary sophistication and fragility of a long isolated biota. We now understand that it is actually Europe that is the new world, colonised by opportunistic weeds 
after the ending of the last ice age. Modern Australian history is like a giant experiment in ecological crisis and management, sometimes a horrifying concentration of environmental damage and cultural loss, and sometimes, sometimes, a heartening parable of hope and learning. Ecologists working in Australia today often feel like they are like ambulance drivers arriving at the scene of an accident. Such a roller coaster of environmental history makes Australians think differently and more sharply than the rest of the world on many ecological matters. We need to write histories that, in the words of the fire historian Stephen Pine, are the intellectual equivalent of ecological regeneration. The intellectual equivalent of ecological regeneration. On such a continent, we can never blithely assume the dominance of culture over nature, nor can we believe in the infinite resilience of the land. We are committed, I think, by history and circumstance to an intellectually innovative environmental inquiry. As evidence that the field of environmental history has reached a rich maturity in Australia, let me point to two recent brilliant books that are environmental histories without needing to declare it. Grace Carskin's The Colony, A History of Early Sydney, published in 2009, and James Boyce's Van Diemen's Land, published in 2008, seamlessly integrate indigenous history, environmental history, and colonial history in subtle and compelling foundational narratives. The National Museum of Australia in Canberra, where I work, aims to achieve the same integration. The environmental and material legacy of the Australian gold fields as a cultural landscape of world significance has also fostered much thoughtful and important historical work in recent years. The foundation story of modern Australia now seems to me to be one of the most moving and challenging histories with which a people might be destined to grapple. It turns out that Australian history is as much about ecological, social and technological disjunctions as it is about political stability and continuity for which settlers first celebrated it. We don't need to turn to Anzac Day and the commemoration of an overseas war for our defining moment of national drama and solemnity. Consider that in 1788, peoples with immensely long and intimate histories of habitation encountered the furthest flung representatives of the world's most industrialised nation. A first fleet that was actually called that. Its ships carefully stowed with seeds and a ballast of convict settlers initiated one of the most self-conscious and carefully recorded colonisations in history on the shores of a land that was beautiful, baffling and like no other. This new land was actually the most ancient and the true nomads were the colonisers. It was both an invasion and an awesome social experiment. There was dancing with strangers and there was war. On our beaches and across the continent ever since, there began to unfold one of the major discontinuities in the course of life on this planet, as has been declared of the Americas in 1492 by historian Alfred Crosby. But Australia was even more unfamiliar to Europeans than America, which had once shared a land bridge with Eurasia and still bore the marks of it. We who have inherited this land are still discovering its secrets and coming to terms with its past. The American writer William Faulkner famously said that the past is never dead, it's not even past. It's a simple, powerful quote declaring what we know to be true, that the past is never gone or left behind. We are never free of either its burden or its inspiration. Since we can't disentangle ourselves from its power, power, we might as well wrestle with it intelligently. It is a quarry of ideas, an archive of possible future scenarios. For example, as we are propelled into the mid-21st century 
the global melting pot of the 19th century looks more fascinating. Some of those broader, more diverse 19th century political definitions of the Australian community, such as that of Australasia, were disremembered at the time of Federation, as the new Commonwealth retreated to its definition as a continent for a nation, and turned its back on Asia and the Pacific in its quest for a white population. This isolation of Australian history, as the Pacific historian Donald Denoon aptly called it, increased in the decades of post-war decolonisation as the comparative framework of British imperial history crumbled. Australian history in those middle decades of the 20th century was active and exciting, but nationalist and in some ways isolationist, and thus relatively ne neglected by the rest of the world. This neglect, wrote Denoon in 1986, seems a terrible pity since Australian scholarship offers arresting insights into non, to, arresting insights to non-Australians precisely because it is so difficult to locate in the context of conventional categories of experience. Dunoon urged the development of historical approaches that would restore Australian experience to the rest of the world and reintegrate Australia into the history of humanity. I think that challenge has been energetically taken up by our generation. And we're now forging those links through the kinds of new histories I've been discussing by exploring Australia's uh, deep human past, its settler frontier, its multicultural diversity, its environmental pr predicament, and its geopolitical destiny. History has emerged as a powerful tool in helping Australians to reimagine their island continent nation as both a constellation of smaller bioregional identities and as a site of a larger of larger transnational social and economic networks. The modern craft of history was shaped by nationalism. Yet in the 21st century world, we'll have to move decisively beyond those origins as we search for histories and stories that find human commonality beyond nation or race or ethnicity. Thus, we have the rise of transnational history, world history, global history, and of big history, a term used by the Australian historian David Christian to describe histories of the, of the universe and of life on Earth since the Big Bang. There's an interesting predominance of Australians among intellectuals teaching and writing big history. And I think it's because Australian, uh, Australian, Australians being Australian means integrating deep time and social history. It means coming to terms with geological and human timescales to an unusual degree. The global climate crisis has made a nonsense of the boundaries between nature and culture. Industrialization has initiated a new geological era that historians like to call the Anthropocene, which is characterised by pervasive human influence on the Earth's processes. It's both awful and awe-inspiring that we're right now living through the very years that see us crossing a threshold of geological eras. Understanding anthropogenic climate change urgently requires deep time historical analyses century-scale histories of science and philosophy, and studies of human and social resilience from both the ancient past and the unfolding present. We need meaningful histories that enable us to see our own fossil fuel society in proper perspective, and to see ourselves not just as a civilization, but as a species. We need to think like a planet and realize our fragile place among the stars. Humanists have been as important as the scientists in delivering these crucial insights. One thing that a detailed scholarly history of the last thousand years tells us is that average global temperature needs to shift only a small amount to have cataclysmic social and political effects. The medieval warm period, which lasted from about 900 to 1300, and the Little Ice Age, which began about 1300 and finished in the 19th century, these were fluctuations of average global temperature of about one degree Celsius at the most. They were tiny compared with the great swings of temperature during the Pleistocene and those that we now face in the coming century. 
But even those relatively small fluctuations of the last thousand years had very significant effects on human geography and society. Australian history, I believe, uh, will contribute to world history and politics on these issues in at least two ways. First, the story of modern Australia, with its embattled agricultural economy and boom and bust ecology, reveals a society and a nature that is especially vulnerable to climate change. And second, Australia's deep human history delivers an inspiring parable about human survival during massive temperature and sea level changes of the last ice age. Archaeologist Mike Smith explores this rich history in a new book published last year called The Archaeology of Australia's Deserts. Although Smith helped to establish some of our oldest dates of human occupation, he believes that a nuanced narrative of cultural change through millennia ultimately conveys depth better than dates. The history, the nuanced history, a nuanced cultural history is what we need to better understand our deep inheritance of human time here. Therefore, in the archaeology of Australia's deserts, Mike Smith works from the ancient past forwards and also from the ethnographic and historical present backwards. This is a new kind of history of Australia emerging. I think there is a coming of age of a settler nation in being able to say that a new book in archaeology is, quite simply, a landmark work in Australian history. It's a great privilege and honour to be invited to join you today as you celebrate and discuss your new and brilliant initiative in research and writing about the history of our country. I know that you'll agree that there is a great advantage in launching such an enterprise from a proud regional city with a rich national and federal history. The kind of partnerships that make history vital can really work meaningfully here. Partnerships between the academy and the community, between scholarship and industry. Public history, great term public history, which draws its energy and scholarly vigour from taking seriously the interface between historians and the community. Public history has been the source of much of the originality of Australian history in recent decades. And you've done it very well here. And this new centre will further strengthen your edge. And a community born in one of the great 19th century movements of people across the world is also the right place to think what history looks like beyond nationalism. When W.B. Withers wrote his History of Ballarat in 1870 and looked back at the less than 20 years that had transformed his city, which he called this mighty creation and one of the wonders of this century, he foreshadowed Eleanor Dark's comments when he declared Ballarat's astonishing story to be stranger than fiction. And that is indeed the nature of truth it requires the best scholarship to make it believable. Withers interviewed ageing pioneers and he walked the streets and countryside looking for clues. He hoped, as he put it, to gather some of the honey of fact from fugitive opportunity, that it might be garnered for the historian of the future. Withers reminds us that this is another role that all of us interested in the future of Australian history should play. We are historians of our own time. We are thoughtful witnesses of events that are unfolding before our eyes. And every day of our lives, we should seek to gather the honey of fact from fugitive opportunity so that future Australians will be enriched. I wish you every success with your new and exciting centre. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, sincerely like to thank Tom for what has been an utterly compelling case for the importance of history in understanding who we are and, and where we're going. Um, it, I think it, is, it will become a landmark speech that people will refer 
to in the many years to come. And fortunately, we have a <laughs> fortunately we have a a, uh, a permanent record of it, which will um, which will go on the on the website of the centre. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, Tom has uh, graciously agreed to um, answer some questions, and I think we have a couple of roving microphones. So we've got about um, uh, five minutes or so just to um, take a couple of questions. So thank you, Lynn and Laura. Questions? Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric Eklund from Federation University. Oh, Tom, thank you so much for a really inspirational uh, call to arms in many ways. Um, there's uh, a lot to, to uh, digest there. Can I just ask you um, specifically on the question of uh, transnational history, I wonder if um, there may be some dangers in this uh, focus on big history and uh, a scale which is very overwhelming and, and in some ways not a human scale. Um, and I know a lot of your work is deeply engaged at community and local level and I wonder how might we try to uh, reconcile some of those challenges around, around transnational and local. Thanks Eric, great question and it's something I've thought about a lot with my own work because I'm attracted to both those scales, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic and try to bring them together uh, from time to time I work and very challenged by making the links between deep time and social history because as you say deep time geological time is unimaginable in a way it's so vast it's almost beyond our capacity uh, to really truly apprehend it so how does it become part of our, our history it's obviously no simple answer but I think there's much to be gained through moving as flexibly as possible across the full spectrum of timescales. So in, for example, the work uh, that John kindly mentioned of mine at the beginning when introducing me about uh, responding to the Black Saturday um, tragedy, uh, people who experienced that felt a, a real need to understand it. And there are short-term political and social timescales on which it must be explained, but there is also a a much deeper time scale which is just as essential it's just as essential to understand the um, the deep ecological rhythms of the communities of trees for example particularly in say the mountain ash forests that uh, um, have evolved over millennia and that themselves require that kind of um, um, catastrophic firestorm to regenerate unless we're able to move beyond the human time scale to sometimes embrace different kinds of deeper environmental rhythms the longer story of Australia's uh, uh, evolution as, uh, as, a, as a biology, indeed, as a, as a, as a ge geological entity, is also important as part of that story. So uh, we don't research them in the same way we as historians research the, the contemporary or the century scale or the human biographical frame. But we have to, I think, uh, try and distill from those larger narratives uh, whatever we can to help us explain things. And I taught a course uh, inspired by David Christian's big history um, advocacy, a, a course at Monash University in the 1990s, where uh, called the Short History of the World. And one of the benefits of becoming human in week five uh, <laughs> took us a while um, was that by the time we concentrated in the last uh, month and a half on the expansion of Europe, the last 500 years, we all had a keen sense of how odd that looked in planetary history and therefore generated new questions and that was really beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Julie Cotter from Federation University. I just want to follow on on the notion of transnational. Um, I was recently at the launch of the Cambridge History of the First World War and it's a, obviously a text, a three volume, 1600 page text generated by Cambridge University. And what was so interesting about that book, it was discussed by the editor as being a transnational history. And then as Ted Bayou got up and discussed, 
Australia, I think, was mentioned three times, and Sir John Monash wasn't mentioned at all. And Sir John Monash was knighted by the king, you know, strode onto the battlefield and knighted him for his contribution. Um, I just want to reiterate, Eric, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, there is a concern about a transnational history from an Australian perspective. I think sometimes we do tend to get lost, even though there were Australian scholars involved in the production of that text. And there was some discussion of memorials and uh, et cetera, but I, I just think that that can be a concern when we think about that transnational notion of history from our perspective. Thank you, uh, Julie. Um, one way I can respond to that, I guess, is, is an example from my own work where uh, I've found myself grappling with some of the same tensions, I suppose, and it is that uh, a few years ago I uh, wrote a history of Antarctica, and it's an unashamed Australian history of Antarctica, and I make this perfectly clear. Um, uh, and one of the, it's a very interesting window on 20th century Australia, on 20th century world history, I think, uh, looking at Antarctica, a place where nationalism takes people into the icy wastes and then propels them into a kind of uh, an international community that they have to deal with. And so from 1959 we have an Antarctic Treaty in operation, which I think is a very successful treaty, and Australia is a, a very influential partner in that treaty. The point of telling this story is to say that um, the way you gain influence, a bit like at the UN, the way you gain influence as a global citizen is as a representative of your nation. So being international doesn't mean being non-Australian. Actually, it requires that you be Australian and that you represent your nation, even your nation's interests, and argue for them. That is how you gain a seat at the table. It is through your nationalism that you uh, enlarge your identity in the global conversation. And it's through your nationalism that you exert your influence for good, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, I think our work on Australia and Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty System, I've been involved in this in the last few years, does show the way in which uh, being uh, patriotic does not necessarily mean being um, a poorer global citizen. You can, there are ways in which, um, in our, as we reach towards various forms of global cooperation, we will have to hang on to our national and have a keener sense of what it actually means and what it's based on. So when I'm arguing for these larger timescales or for different ways in which we might imagine the Australian community, it doesn't mean stepping away from an Australian history. It means simply diversifying the ways in which we uh, imagine Australian identity. So I hope that relates uh, to your question. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll need to uh, conclude the brief question session, but there will obviously be an opportunity to talk further with um, Tom over morning tea. But right now I'd like to just present you with a couple of gifts. Um, <coughs> And um, rather than just being anonymous gifts that I pass to you and you squirrel away, I thought I should tell you about them because we have given considerable thought about how we can continue to help you with the writing and the thinking. So the first is a gift of wine. <laughs> but because, because of your deep conviction and your commitment to place and history, uh, the wines have been carefully selected. One is a uh, Tomboy Ballarat Pinot Noir from 2010. Um, a very local wine. And the second is a Luigi Bazzani Shiraz Cabernet from the Pyrenees. But I can vouch for both of them. <laughs> both of them very good. So, so that's the first gift. Thank and you. Thank that's, you very much. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And and the second gift brought out my Scottish heritage of finding very, very cheap gifts. In fact, this one was free, but I think um, symbolically you will appreciate it. Um, this is a leaf from the Tree of Knowledge at the Mount Helen campus of the University of Ballarat. I didn't pluck it from the living tree. I found it yesterday afternoon underneath the tree. 
the, the significance of this tree of knowledge, is, I think it's correct, and to say it's now in its 120th year, or there about 120th year. And um, it is a, is a very potent symbol um, of the university, the new uh, Federation University. And we hope that this will become your favourite bookmark. <laughs> we also have a, a brief explanation of the, um, the history of the Tree of Knowledge and its significance for our institution. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You, thank thank you. You.